Well, let me introduce to you my very dear friend, and he's a, he's a mentor to me, and he's too young to be my father, but he certainly is a mentor and an older brother to me in the faith. A man that God has used, he's written a number of books, and they're, they're at a table out there that would really bless you and help you grow in the things of God. He pastors a church in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Does anybody know where Cape Girardeau, Missouri is? All eight of you, hallelujah. But God has done an unusual thing there. He's caused his church to grow. It's really a, it's really a mega church in the midst of a smaller community. People drive in, they use powerfully in media and TV. And, and more than all of that, great preacher, flows in the Holy Ghost. More, more than all of that, let me tell you uh, about our brother. As I said in the first service, and I've told you before, I am not impressed with somebody who can preach the paint off of walls. I'm not impressed by, I used to be. I used to be, and I used to try to be like them. Oh, I want to preach like T.D. Jakes one day or something. I, I found out I'm the, I'm the best me that there is, and so I'm just going to be me. It took me a little while to grow up, but I'm thankful I don't have that pain of comparison anymore. I'm not impressed by anointing or gifting or talent or how well somebody can sing or play or, or any of that stuff money or fame or fortune not impressed by any of that anymore what i am impressed by is a man or a woman for that matter that has a godly marriage a healthy marriage and they make it through the storms and they overcome stuff and, and you can always see in their faces the radiance I, i'm impressed by that i'm impressed by kids that that serve the lord and and character and integrity that's what i'm impressed by and this man has all of that in spades great man of god put your hands together for my dear friend pastor gary well good morning family it's great to see you this morning give jesus a great hand clap this morning if you would right now yes you can be seated if you want to if you want to thank you worship team awesome job again thank you for your faithfulness in three services this morning as well i appreciate that so much i've been doing multiple services for 21 years uh and so i love multiple services love i love it it means something's happening as the church is growing well good morning everybody as pastor said i'm gary brothers from cape Girardeau, missouri we've been there for 22 and a half years now and god has blessed us there but i've also for those of you that we may be new meeting for the first time today i'm also kind of a part of the, well, not kind of, I am a part of the King's Chapel Wasilla family as well. Dr. Uh, Morocco and Colleen are good friends of Rose and I. I preach many times in Maui and in several of the, uh, the campuses, the extensions. And, but uh, don't tell anybody, but this is my favorite one. <clears throat> and uh, I was talking to Pastor um, this week, and I believe the first time I preached here in Wasilla was 1998 with Pastor Ken. And uh, so I go back a long way. I was staying at the Best Western out here on Lake uh, Lucille um, on 9-11, the original one. And uh, I preached that night in the barn out here on the new property. It was jam-packed, people standing around the walls. Um, have a lot of history here with King's Chapel. Uh, I came and looked at this building with Pastor Ken to see, give Dr. Morocco my opinion on it. I called Dr. Morocco and said, you need to sell that property and buy this one. It'll move you ahead five years in this community, and then God will provide. And so they did. So I have a lot of intrinsic connection to this church family. And then a few weeks ago, Pastor Daniel called me, and he started talking about the, the old property out there. And before he told me what was going on, I knew in my spirit, we got it back. <laughs> got it back. And I was so thrilled Saturday morning to drive up there and step out on the property, spent about an hour and a half there with Pastor and several of you all that were there to pray that morning. And I walked in the old barn, and it was piled with clutter and books and everything. I I stood there where I stood and preached in 2001. I walked across the property where the old tent was. The last time I preached there, it was on the tent, in the tent. 
And then I looked at, saw where God had had somebody to fill in, a whole big area there where we could put a big sanctuary. And I said, thank you, Jesus, for filling that in for us, leveling that off. And I, I stood out there and just thanked God for his faithfulness. Let me tell you something. What God starts, he finishes. He didn't give you that property back just to pray on it. He gave you that property back to be on it and to establish something great should Jesus comes. If he comes tomorrow, I'm ready to go. How about you? Like my mom always told me, you need to be prayed up, packed up, and ready to go up. And so I, I am. I am. But should Jesus tarry, we're going to do something great out there and really be a beacon. I told Pastor, I said, I can't wait till when I drive into Wasilla from Anchorage and I'm coming down that road that I look up there and I see on the hill what God wants to do. But you know, that's just a building. What he's really doing, I'm looking at right now. I'm seeing right here with you and people around this area that's being touched. And I really believe there are a lot of good churches in this, in this state, but I really believe God has positioned this church here to plant churches all over Alaska, to break curses and strongholds and really set people free that the light of the gospel will shine around this great state. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that today? I give the Lord praise for just one time this morning. Just thank him and bless him today. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, my two son-in-laws are with me. One is going to be speaking Wednesday night. Uh, ben, he's working the table back there, and he was our lead youth pastor for several years. He's now the uh, station manager and ministers around the area for uh, KHIS 89.9 FM radio. It's the largest contemporary Christian radio station between Memphis and St. Louis, and he's doing a great job with that. My other son-in-law is preaching at Anchorage this morning, and he'll be back He'll be back here tonight speaking, David Erzy from St. Louis. And uh, we're going to get right into the Word today. It's Mission Sunday. I love it. I love to come to Alaska, but to get to preach about missions, that is my favorite topic. And before we get into that, I just want to mention some product I've got out there. I've got two books. This one is a re-release of a book I released in 99. We renamed it, and I added some things to it, Burning Bushes. It's about discovering your divine destiny. If you've got, uh, really, this is for any age. My wife reread it the other day, and my wife actually said, man, there's some good stuff in there, Gary. And if your wife says that, you know it's got to be good. One of the things I struggled with as a young man was knowing what God's purpose for my life was. Any, anybody ever struggle with that any at all in your life? Probably not now, but at some point in time. God, how do I know your will? And uh, a few years into the ministry, the Lord took Exodus 3 and just unpacked it for me real quick, and that's what this book of, is about, Burning Bushes, How to Discover Your Destiny, to Know Your Destiny, the, the five things that God changes in our life to move us in our destiny. By the way, you could be a businessman or businesswoman, a mom or a dad, a couple, and God's going to choose. He may be changing your destiny. He'll take you through these five things to prepare you for that. Five things that God does in our life to prepare us for destiny and five excuses we all come up with to keep us from our destiny. <clears throat> That's all there. That book's $10. And the other one was Barred Vessels. It's my latest book. The hidden power of relationships, everything God has taught me about relationships. Relationships are the most valuable thing God has given us. Have you ever heard the old saying, well, you can't take it with you when you go? There is something you can take with you when you leave, and that's relationships. And you can take them either direction, by the way. They're the most powerful thing God has given us. The, most, the greatest thing God has given us is relationship with him. And I tell the story about the young lady, and I'm going to use that text today in one of my, one of my thoughts of my message whose husband died. He was in the school of prophets. And the prophet came to her and she said, you know, can you help me? He said, what do you have in your house? He said, I don't have anything but a jar of oil. And he said, that, go borrow vessels from your neighbors. Now, that's the basis, the premise for this book because you see what she had in her house was only half of her miracle. Her faith, her little jar of oil represented her faith. Everybody say faith. And her faith determined the quality of her miracle. But what she had outside her house... <clears throat> Her relationships determine the quantity of her miracle. If she had poured, fill a five-gallon bucket full of oil with that little jar, it would have been a miracle, but it only lasts for a couple of weeks. But God gave her a miracle that took her from having her house repoed from the bank by being, to being on the bank board in one day. How many believe that's the kind of miracles we need? We don't need to live from miracle to miracle. We just need one that lasts a lifetime. I share in here five relationships that everybody needs in their life. The warning signs, five warning signs of bad relationships. If you read that chapter and you think of some people and you check, they, they, they fit about three or four of those. It's time for a change, brother. 
Time, time for a change. It'll help you. If you'd like to give both of them, that book is $15. If you'd like both of them today, you can give them for $20. All of it goes to our missions organization, Vision of Hope International. It all goes to missions. And so if you'd like to invest in that, invest in your family, please feel free to pick those up on your way out today, $20 for both of them today. I want everybody here today, I just want to ask a question. How many, how many of you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Just kind of wave at me. Well, take that hand and put it over your heart and say this out loud with me. Thank you, Jesus for saving me. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the preacher, the prayer, the sower that helped me know you. Amen. That's missions. That's what we're going to talk about today. You're saved today. I'm saved today because somebody preached a message. Somebody sowed a seed. Somebody prayed a prayer. Do you believe that? You know, missions, this, I'm going to share a short message, but missions is really about the dream of God. You know, I've learned if you touch God's dream, God will touch your dream. What is God's dream? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. In every person's world, we define that in our church is going to every person's world. So we go in through radio, through television, through the written word, through broadcast, live casting, live streaming, through having services, through feeding the sick, uh, praying for the sick, feeding the hungry, clothes, all those type of things. There are concentric circles of worlds right here in Wasilla and around this, this great state. And God says go into all the world and preach the gospel. But many times in our lives, we, we don't feel like that, that, the, that, that we can do everything. And I want to share a message with you this morning just to simply says, I can't do everything, but I can do everything I can. Say that with me, please. I can't do everything, but I can do everything that I can. Right before I get into that message, I want to share a word that's just for this church. I believe the Lord gave it to me flying on the plane up here the other day, and this is it. This is real brief. And if this doesn't apply to you, fine, just... Hang on, I'm going to get to the message in a second. But this, I believe, is a personal word for this church and for people in the church. The word shalom is a familiar one in the church. We know it means peace. When we hear it, we, the word shalom, we, we think of everything being peaceful and calm and serene. But when you look at the word shalom in the Hebrew language, it translates as destroying the authority of chaos. So peace comes only when you destroy the authority that's connected to the chaos. Biblical peace comes not from pacifism, but from destroying those things that are bringing chaos to the world. When Satan's authority is destroyed, true peace will reign in your life. Many people are trying to deal with and manage the chaos, but true peace will come when you deal with the authority of the chaos. Get rid of the root, and the fruit will be peace or shalom in your life. I believe the Lord is saying to some of you here today that you've been dealing with some chaos, perhaps in your business, perhaps in your home, perhaps even in your own personal mind and your thoughts. God says if you quit dealing with the chaos and focus on the source of the chaos and you take authority over that in your life because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if you take the name of Jesus and take authority over the chaos, the, the, the destroyer, the one who's bringing the chaos, the fruit of the chaos will change to be sweet peace in your life. Amen. That's your word today. Everybody say, I can't do everything, but I can do everything I can. You know, I don't as much want to preach today as I will tell some stories, which that all kinds of go together anyway. The first one is about a boy with a lunch. Everybody say lunch. Now, don't get hungry on me and leave. Matthew 14, 15 through 18 gives us a familiar story. It says, when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves some food. But Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Now, this is a familiar story in all the Gospels, but only one Gospel gives us the source of this fish lunch. And that is a little boy. John chapter 6, verse 9 says, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? You know, that's a question that all of us have asked ourselves from time to time. What am I? What do I have? What are my resources? What are my abilities among all the great need in the world? I can't do much. I can't give much. I can't reach many people. 
What I have is so insignificant when compared to the massive need. Why should I really do anything? You know, although John and the other disciples probably thought that boy's lunch was very little, Jesus responded differently. Jesus could have said, yeah, I could eat that myself and still be hungry. But he didn't. Jesus simply said, bring it to me. Bring it here to me. Now, I wonder what the disciples thought when Jesus said, bring it here to me. Do you think they may have thought, well, he's just going to eat that in front of us. After all, he's the man of God. And we got one lunch. You might as well feed the preacher. Come on, I'm, uh, I'm on. I'm, uh, I'm not getting many amens on that, but you might as well give it to him. Or did you think maybe they thought, wow, Jesus is going to do something really special. It's going to be really cool. I mean, well, I bet he makes that fish turn into a 500-pound halibut. He, he's, he's, he, they're they just going to get world record. I know the world record's for something. But he's just going to turn them into the, and, 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 and wow, it's going to be awesome. He's just going to do something awesome. I don't think so. I don't think they had a clue. They just took it to him and thought, well, what's he going to do with it? In reality... In our lives, we look at our lives many times like that little lunch. It's like, well, I don't have much. Man, look at the need, the thousands of people out here. I got one lunch. That little boy could say, you know what? They're probably going to beat me up and take this away from me. But he didn't. He brought it to the disciple, and the disciple brought it to Jesus. Notice that Jesus didn't expect them to feed the thousands. Jesus did not expect them to feed the thousands with that lunch. He only expected them to bring the lunch to him. Can I say to you here today, God doesn't expect you and I to reach the world, all the world. We can't reach all the world. We can't do everything, but we can do everything we can. What does he expect us to do? He expects us to bring what we have to him. If he wants a lunch, he wants us to bring the lunch, but my lunch is not much. And Jesus could look back at you and I, and we say, well, my talent's not much, my ability's not much, my lunch is not much, and Jesus could look at us and say, yeah, you're right. In fact, it's probably less than what you think it is. But it's not about the value of the lunch. It's about the power of the hand of Jesus. He said, just bring it to me. I know you guys, without me, that lunch is not much. But with me, that lunch can feed a multitude. That lunch can change our world. That lunch can transform this whole scene if you'll just bring it to me. And they did. And we know what Jesus did with that lunch. He blessed it, he broke it, he multiplied. See, the potential of the little boy's lunch was connected to his submission to Jesus. Do you know the, the potential in your life is, con, is connected, the potential is connected to your submission to Jesus? I mean, you may be very smart, you may be very, very intelligent, you may have a successful business. But when you stand before God, is that what he called you to do? And did you fulfill it to the depth that you could? Without him, I would have to say, sir or ma'am, no, you did not. But when you submit it to him, when you submit your life totally to him, whatever he's called you to do. I never wanted to be a preacher. I wanted to be a businessman, and I struggled with that for 10 years. And that's, that's why God gave me the revelation of burning bushes and how he transformed and took me from point A to point B and helped me to understand that. I wanted to be a businessman. I wanted to be the one to make the money and to give the money to the church and help the pastor and to build buildings and do all of those things. My wife and I are givers. We're one of the top givers in our church every year, and we have a fairly large church with a fairly large budget compared to others. And, and but, but I say that because we are givers. That's our heart. But God, my potential wasn't released until I finally laid it all on the line and all of my business ventures and everything I had and I put it to the cross and say, God, if this is what you want, okay, I'll be a pastor, but you're making a mistake. That's exactly what I told him. I wonder sometimes, some mornings, he's like, yeah, I probably did. But my potential was released when I submitted it all to him. The same thing is true in this lunch and the question of this little story is very simply, what is Jesus wanting you to put in his hand. Now, I know this is Mission Sunday, and it's about raising money for missions. It's about supporting missions. It's about, about touching. million for missions is the goal, it says, for all of the King's Cathedral and King's, Campus, Camp, uh, King's Chapel uh, extensions. And you may say, well, I, and there may be people here that could write a million-dollar check. That would be fine. But, but the point is, what does God want you to do? Well, I can only give $5 a month, and that's not much. Is it all you can do? Is it what God wants you to do? Yes, then it's much. It's, not, it's only $5 in your hands, but when you put it in the hands of God, it becomes something different. When you release it, something happens. By the way, in case I forget to say this at the end, when that leaves your hand, it never leaves your life. When you sow it into the kingdom of God, it never leaves your life. 
It's always in your life. Why? Because it came out of your hand to the master, and he gave it to him. Do you know at the end of that story, they picked up 12 baskets of fish and bread? What do you think they did with it? I know what they did with it because I know what the Bible says. The Bible says, do not be mocked. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. That's good or bad. That boy went home that day with five bushel baskets full of fish and bread. He, he had the re original Long John Silver. It's opened up right there. I, I'm telling you, he had enough to start a restaurant right there. He went into commercial, commercial fishing business. Come on. He went, that was, his, that was his, his blessing. He just didn't pat the little boy on the head and say, bless your heart, like we do in the South. That little boy could have went home and said, Mommy, you got something to eat? She said, Well, I gave you a lunch. She said, Yeah, but this preacher took it. <laughs> no, he went home and said, Mama, you got any more room in the kitchen? Said, what do you mean? Well, I gave my lunch to this preacher, and he gave me back 12 baskets full of fish and bread. But the preacher was Jesus. The boy didn't know that when he gave it. All he did is he did all he could do. And here's the question. What does Jesus want you to put in his hand? And this is not just about money, folks. It could be about anything in your life, your talent. Maybe you've got a child that's running away from God. You need to put that child in God's hands. I mean, literally commit them to the Lord. Say, God, whatever it takes to save my baby, whatever it takes to bring them home, whatever it takes to redeem them, God, and lay them on the altar and say, God, they're all yours. Do what it takes to bring them in. What is God asking you today to put in his hand? The second story is in 2 Kings 4, 1 through 3. It's the one about the woman with the jar of oil that I mentioned earlier. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take away my two sons to be slaves. So Elisha said to her, What do, I, what do you want me to do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? It's interesting. He turned the question on her. She was asking what she could do for her, and he said, What, what have you got? What do you have in the house? She said, Well, I don't have anything. Your maidservant has nothing except a jar of oil. Now, I want you to notice that she equated her jar of oil as nothing. Everybody say nothing. And then he said to her, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from every neighbor, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. Once again, we see a person with limited resources and an unlimited need. This woman said, the creditors are coming to take my babies away. And when asked by Elisha, she said, I don't have anything, nothing. Everybody say nothing. She valued what she had as nothing. She valued as nothing. Many times we value what we have as nothing. My talent's nothing. My time is nothing. My abilities are nothing. My intellect is nothing. My, 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 my smile is nothing. I, I have nothing to give to God. Well, you know what you're saying? You know what, what we're saying really when we say that what I have is nothing? What we're saying is God made nothing. It's an insult to God. You ever stood in the mirror and say, man, you, you, I don't want anybody to know this, but you really look ugly. Or, or if you're, I've done this before. I've looked in the mirror and said, I've, just, I've been so frustrated with myself in times past when I was super immature. I'm all mature now. But, then, but at that time, I stood in the mirror and looked at myself, and I've called myself stupid. You know, the Bible says calls those things as not as though they were, so I learned to start calling myself intelligent and highly favored of the Lord. You see, when I, when I say negative things about myself, I'm insulting the king of glory who created me in his image. And so she was insulting, really. I don't have anything. I've got nothing. I have a jar of oil, and it's nothing. I have a talent to sing, but it's nothing. I have an ability to breathe, but it's nothing. So as I can't do anything, I can do nothing. Can you stand up? Yes. Can you smile? Yes. Can you hand a bulletin? Yes. Then we can sign you up to be a greeter at the door. Can you walk? Can you carry a, a bucket that weighs a half an ounce? Can you, can you take and receive an offering? Can you do anything? Can you fold bulletins? Can you, can you make phone calls? Can you, can you paint walls? Can you, can you do anything? Well, that's, that's, not, that's not the gospel. Oh, it is the gospel because it all comes together. I can't do everything, but I can do everything I can. If God only created people to preach, who would build the buildings? If God only created people to preach, who, who, would, who would raise the money? If God only... Hey, this more things to do than hold a microphone and preach the gospel. 
God created each of us as a part of the body to do something. And what you have is something, and it's valuable. And when you use it, when you bring that lunch to him, and when you pour out that jar of oil, by the way, nothing happened until she turned that oil up and began to pour it out. Nothing will ever happen until you begin to release what's in your heart and your life. Oh, God's given me a gift. What are you doing with it? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm protecting it. I'm praying over it that someday it'll just explode with a great anointing. Oh, it's going to touch the world. Someday, what are you doing with it? Oh, Pastor God has called me to, 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 to be a great evangelist. So what are you doing in our church? Well, I'm just praying for God to use me to be a great evangelist. Well, are you teaching a class? No, I'm waiting on God to use me to be a great evangelist. Well, are you in our ushers? No. Are you in our intercessory ministry? No. Are you in the worship team? No. I, what do you do? I just pray for God to use me to be a great evangelist. Stop it. Get your jar out and start pouring some oil somewhere. Do something. The miracle is not released until the oil is poured out. You know, when I stand before God someday, there's two words I want to hear. Well done. I appreciate the crowns and all of that and the jewels. That's fine. I had somebody ask me a question about that the other day. Pastor, would you explain the jewels and the crowns? I said, no, not really. I hope yours is wonderful and blessed, and I may have one with some jewels or whatever, some pieces of coal in them. I don't know. I don't really care. I, 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 if I get a crown, that's fine. That's wonderful. If I get a robe, that's fine. If I get a mansion, that's fine. But here's what I want to Here's what I want to When I get to heaven, I want to hear Jesus say, well done. I do not want to hear medium rare. I, I want to hear those words. Thy good and faithful servant. Yeah, the only way I'm going to be faithful is if I pour out what he put in me. And even it may not seem like much. It really might. And most of the time I don't feel like it is. But the question is, what is Jesus wanting you to pour out today? What is it in your life he's wanting you to pour out? Well, it, it won't matter. It won't matter. It will make a difference. Yeah, it will make a difference when it touches his hands. When it touches his hands. You know why people don't pray? You know the number one reason people don't pray? is because they do not feel their prayers will make a difference. Well, I don't have enough faith. I'm not holy enough. I'm not deep enough. I'm not mature enough. I'm not well. I, I, it won't make a difference. It won't make a difference. Well, it, may, it might not make a difference to you, but when it ascends to the throne of God and it falls into the hand of Jesus, seated to the right hand of the Father, it makes a difference. What is God wanting you to pour out? One more story. In Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, we read these words. Now, Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. By the way, he still does that today. And many who were rich put in much. And then one poor widow came. Everybody say, poor widow. Come on, say it with passion. Poor widow. Then one poor widow came and she threw in two mites, which makes, a, which makes a quadrant. In today's economy, that's about a half a cent. So he called his disciples to himself and he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that, that this poor widow has put in more than all of these who have given in the treasury. For they put in out of their abundance, but she put in out of her poverty, put in all that she had her whole livelihood. Now, Jesus used this as a teaching moment for his disciples. And I've heard preachers before talk about how Jesus stopped the offering and said, everybody look at this woman. She is, and he did not do that. I've heard preachers preach. He was, he was telling the rich people that they needed to bring everything to him. He wasn't doing that. This was a private teaching moment with his disciples. After all of it was over, Jesus didn't say anything when they walked by. He pulled his disciples to the side, and he began to teach them. He said, I want to show you a principle here. This little woman, you remember the poor widow that came by? Yeah. She gave more than everybody else. Do what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, you see, she gave, she gave out of her poverty. She gave all she had. They, they gave out of their abundance. Now, Jesus was not criticizing everybody else's giving. He was thankful for that. Unless he tells you to give all, you don't give all. You give a tithe, admissions giving, and, and offerings that God impresses on your heart. 
And that's what they did. The, the rich brought in and they gave much, and that was wonderful and it was awesome, and that's what helped the gospel there. He wasn't criticizing them. He was drawing a point to teach his disciples that there are times that if you really, 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 there are times when you have to give it all, and every one of them gave all. Every one of them died for the gospel's sake. God used a little woman, a poor widow, to teach his disciples a lesson about laying it all on the line. She gave everything. You know, from old hymns that we used to sing when I was growing up, like, I surrender all. Have you know that old hymn? I surrender all. To new courses like, I give myself away. Hey, hey, hey. I give myself away. You know, I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm having fun. I don't know about you, but all of those lyrics are expressed in these words. I give it all to Jesus. All those songs from I surrender all to I give myself away and all the other was just saying, I surrender, I give it to Jesus. I'm putting it all on the line. And through a simple offering, this widow gave all. So you can tell more about people by what they give than what, they're, what they have. But what we're willing to release than by what we're wanting to keep. The interesting thing about all of these people is this. We don't know their names. A boy with the lunch. What's your name, son? Boy with lunch. <laughs> woman with jar of oil. He's boy with lunch, me, woman with jar of oil. And then, poor widow. What's your name, sweetheart? Poor widow. That's my name in the Bible, poor widow. We don't know their names, but God used three nameless people to really show us the true essence of serving God in life. That there are times when God wants us to bring something and put in his hand, and it's different at different times. And don't try to mock and mimic somebody else when they get up and they tell their testimony, God told me to give my car away. So you run and give your car away and you walk for three months and then have to borrow money to buy one. It's called God didn't tell you to give your car away, okay? Don't, don't, don't try to counterfeit somebody else's testimony. But if he tells you to do something, then do. Bring your lunch. Sometimes God says, I want you to pour out something. But it's all I have poured out. Because the miracle starts when you start pouring. And the third thing is there are times when God says, I want you to lay it all on the line. All on the line. Did you know God owns it all anyway? That's the greatest, I think the greatest thing that God ever calls any of us to do at times in our life, to lay it all on the line. You know, Pastor Daniel talked about my family, and I have a wonderful family, and uh, my wife and I just celebrated uh, 40 years of marriage, and uh, we met in the first grade, so we've known each other a long time. Uh, I was five years old. That's when I met my wife. Mm -hmm. Didn't know it was my wife, but I got two beautiful daughters. One is on our staff. She's our worship coordinator, coordinates all the worship teams. We have about 100 people involved in our various worship teams. At Lee University, got her degree, got her master's degree. She's married to Ben. Two beautiful grandkids. Mother, daughter's an attorney in St. Louis. She went to RU and then to SLU University and loves God. Both, both studied in England, one in Cambridge, one in Oxford. I studied in Kentucky. <laughs> White Plains Elementary. <laughs> South Hopkins High School. Passed up a scholarship out of, out of school, out of high school, because end of the Vietnam War, and so we're all going to die anyway. Passed up a scholarship and went to, it's going to be a millionaire time, I was 30 anyway, so I went to work. Call of God was on my life, but didn't want to be a preacher. But there came a day when I had to lay it all on the line. My business ventures, everything I had, everything, I, lay, I got rid of all of it. Walked away from everything, started over. I laid it all on the line. My little girls were little, little girls then. And I believe because I laid it all on the line then, 
Both my daughters love God, serve God. They're both married to preachers. They both preach. They both travel around the world in missions. Both of them been in multiple countries. They love God with all their heart. And I look back to that day when I said, God, if you want me to be a preacher, I will, but you're making a mistake. I'd probably be divorced today, and who knows what my daughters would be today because I almost lost my marriage trying to do my own thing. In March, we celebrated 40 years of marriage. And it was on Mission Sunday. Mission Sunday. And I surprised her. She didn't know it, but I put two of our worship guys together and myself, and we played a guitar trio, and I sang three songs to her on Sunday morning. Did little George Jones, little James Taylor. Yeah. And then, then I sang a, I sang a James Taylor song, you, You're My Friend. And she sat there on the front row. Why? Because of the faithfulness of God. In your hands you have right now little missions card here it says you know I believe this year God will allow me to give so much a month and so much a year and you sign your name and you put your address but let me tell you what that is this card is just a way to connect your faith your faithfulness of God we call it our church a faith promise we don't call it a pledge a pledge is based on what you've got a faith promise is based on what God can get through you a pledge is between you and the church but a faith promise is between you and God a man at one of our campuses, our extensions, I met with him a couple of weeks after our World Fest, and he said, you know, Pastor, my wife and I, we, felt we, we really were inspired this year. We wanted to do great things for missions, so we started to fill out a faith promise card for $50,000. We want to give $50,000 this year. Well, I would have jumped up and down, rolled over for that, have been excited. But he said, you know, when I started to write it down, the Holy Spirit said, that's not faith. You got that. He's got a successful business. And so my wife and I prayed, and we doubled it. We put down $100,000. We're going to give $100,000 to missions. That's above their ties. Wow, what faith. Just a couple of weeks after he did that, a company came to him with a proposal wanting him to bid, and he's the lead guy on it right now. And if it goes through, his business will more than double this year through that one contract. That's on one end of the spectrum. Another, my, my, my children's pastor brought, my lead children's pastor brought me an envelope in staff meeting, a copy of it, that is, from bookkeeping, where it's, in children's church, it had tithe, 50 cents, and where it was missions, 50 cents. And it was from a seven-year-old whose mom helped them fill it out and was teaching them how to give to missions. I shared that in the pulpit. The next week, there was a stack of them from children's church. In May, they had a goal at our main campus to raise $1,000 in our main children's church over a four-week period. Now, I'm talking about kids, okay, to go towards our former youth pa children's pastor who's now raising money to go to Cameroon, he and his wife and two daughters as missionaries. And they wanted to raise $1,000 for them in the month of May. And he said, I was going to do it 500 but said, I felt like the Holy Spirit said that's not faith. So we made it 1000 I said, well, go for it. And yesterday, we, or last Sunday, we brought a bunch of kids in every service up on the platform and cheered and jumped up and down because they raised $1,149 and some odd cents in four weeks for missions. You know, their entire churches don't give that much a year. A little five-year-old girl went to her mommy and said, Mommy, I want to raise money for missions. She said, What do you want to do? I want to have a lemonade stand. So her mama helped her put a lemonade stand. She raised about $75 for missions. Rose and I were... Our kids were going somewhere the other day, and Rose gave her daughter $20, and our little grandson, our granddaughter, she, she'll be eight this month, gave her $20 and gave her little grandson, who's three and a half, $20 for wherever they were going. And her mommy asked her what she's going to do with the $20. She said, I'm going to do something with $10, and the other $10 I'm going to put into missions. Our grandson said, I'm going to buy a truck. You know, he's three and a half. You'll get it, okay? I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. I'm going to turn it to the pastor. I want you to pray, Lord, what are you and I going to do about, about your dream this year? About reaching people. What are you and I going to do? Listen, you can't do everything. But you can do everything you can. You can't do everything. Don't try it. 
Just do everything you can. Just do what God puts in your heart to do. Would you pray this with me? Say, Lord Jesus, what are you and I going to do about your dream of reaching people through missions this year? Holy Spirit, speak to me. Release to me the number, the amount of what you want me to give. And, and Lord, if there are things that are not money that you want me to give, like my time or prayer time, speak that to me, and I'll do it. I'll obey. I'll put it in your hand. I'll pour it out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, may it be so in every person's life here today. And let this word resonate in their hearts. And let faith rise, God. Thank you, Jesus, for the very air that we breathe right now. And for allowing us to do everything we can. Amen. If the Lord's speaking to you, fill that out right now. If you're, not, if you're here without your husband or wife or, and uh, you need to talk to them, bring it back tonight, bring it back this week, take it home, get in agreement, get the mind of the Lord, and let's see what King's Chapel, Alaska, can do this year in missions. Pastor, God bless you. Thank you. Put your hands together for our dear brother. <laughs> Worship team, would you come? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and receive this right now. If you would take a moment to fill that card out, as Pastor Gary just said. And uh, if you need an envelope, we're going to receive our missions offering right now for the month. And every first Sunday of the month, we'll be receiving our missions offering. So you make a commitment as the Lord leads you. Amen. Ushers, if you'd assist us, I know we need an envelope up front here for my lovely wife. If you need one, would you slip your hand up? Hey, good word, Pastor Gary. Praise the Lord. Now, I just wanted to emphasize that I don't think they started dating at five years old, him and his wife. They just met when they were, they started dating when they were seven. Okay, well, you know, that's Kentucky for you. Hallelujah. Oh, we're just teasing. What a, what a, what a great couple. It's true, though. They met in the first grade. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. so blessed to what God's doing in and through us. Do I have worship team this, this afternoon here, this morning? Good. Because otherwise I'm going to start singing three songs just like Pastor Gary did, but it might not be as good. <laughs> Ushers, would you come, please? Let me tell you what I heard a preacher say once. Um, Larry Stockstill, a friend of ours. That the day you stop giving to missions is the day you cast your vote for the gospel to stop going around the world. Let me say that again. The day you stop giving to missions is the day you cast your vote for the gospel to not go to the ends of the earth. Do you know today's Pentecost Sunday? How many of you know that? Did you know it's Pentecost Sunday today? Do you know they also gave an awe, a special offering on Pentecost Sunday too? And you can see that in Scripture. Jesus said, wait till you're endued with power. And then he said, go into the ends of the earth. So just so thankful for all that God's doing in and through us. Amen. I appreciate your generosity and your giving. Your, so many people faithful in their tithe and their, and their giving. And now missions as we recommit. We do, this, we do this every year, commit ourselves to missions. Come on, let's pray. Come on, hold your, hold your missions card and your envelope as Lord, the Lord is leading you. Hold it up to the Lord. Father, thank you. We pray, God, for every missionary that we're supporting. Lord, in our over, overseas works, and we pray and ask, God, for your power to come. You multiply this as you did for the, the woman with the oil. You'd multiply it like the boy with the lunch. Lord, like the poor widow. God, you would use this we can't do everything, but we can do all we can do. So, Lord, let us use this now as we release it into your hands. Little becomes much when it's in the hand of God. 
So bless the gift and the giver and multiply it many times over. Let the gospel go throughout the world with tremendous momentum and fire because we even gave today and in the months that are yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, would you go right ahead? Would you all stand up on your feet? Come on, just lift your hands to the Lord. Come on, just worship Him. Thank Him. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We bless you. Come on, thank Him right out loud for the privilege. The privilege we have to be able to do something for the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We have this moment, this brief moment, our life, but a vapor to be able to give something to you be a living sacrifice Lord we, we love you we praise you hallelujah you know you might be here and not right with God never close a service in this house without giving an opportunity to give your heart to Jesus because that's why we're here we are we are here to win the lost and to make disciples that's why we're here and if you're not right with God or maybe you've drifted in your walk what do you mean right with God? What does that mean? Let me make it plain. Has anybody here ever lied before besides me? Okay, don't lie again. Come on, anybody here lie? All right, okay. Has, has anybody here ever uh, taken the Lord's name in vain? All right, good. I mean, it's not good, but I mean, you know, being honest. Yeah. Anybody here ever lusted after someone? Now, I personally, I'm a preacher, never done that before. You ever stolen? Don't lie. By our own admission, really, we've broken, I mean, you just broke five of the Ten Commandments right there. Look, you don't need a rule book, although we're thankful that we'll have one. You need a Savior. We need a Savior. And the, and the only way to have your sin wiped out have your sin forgiven to have your sin as the Bible says atoned for washed away and cleansed is by the blood the Bible says in the book of Leviticus without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin so today and with the sound of my voice to those online listening by podcast or here in the sanctuary if your sin is not covered you better get it covered today get covered today repent ask God to come into your life you're here. You've never done that before. You want to give your heart to Jesus for the loop. I'm not talking about joining a church. And don't don't play. Don't get religious and play some religious game. There's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, you should do it today. Do it today. I implore you. I plead with you. Give your heart to Jesus today. If you've given your heart to Him, but you know you've drifted away and you need to recommit your life to Him. Won't you do it? On the count of three, if you slip, if fit in any of those two categories, go ahead and slip your hand up. One, give your heart to Jesus for the first time or make a recommitment. One, two, three. Do it right now. God bless you all the way in the back. Anybody else? God bless you. I see that hand. Raise your hand high if you meant business with God. I see that hand. Son, praise God. Wonderful. God bless you. Perhaps online. Come on now, just in all sincerity, pray right out loud. Say, Dear Jesus, Come on, right out loud, say, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me on a cross. Thank you for rising from the grave for me so that I could have a new life. Forgive me of all of my sin and come into my heart, come into my life and be my Lord, be my Savior. Wash me, cleanse me, make me new. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, I pray, touch each and every one. Break every bondage. Break every chain and every curse. Fill them now, I pray. Fill each and every one of us right now. And use us to fulfill all the purpose you have for us before the word was even formed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Reach across and take someone by the hand as we close this morning. 
Come on, you pray for the person on your right, person on your left. Thank you for coming to our second service. We've got one more at noon. Don't miss church tonight if we're able to come 6 o'clock. Wednesday night, midweek service, ministry for the whole family. Father, thank you so much for what you've done today. Now bless your people, God, we pray and ask. Bless your people. Cause your face to shine upon them. Lift up your countenance towards them. Be gracious to them. Keep them and give them peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll hope to see you tonight.